brand safety and suitability, and how it fits in with content moderation. That's what we're talking about today on Sounds Profitable, Ad Tech Applied, with me, Brian Barlow. And me, Ariel Nissenblatt. We're supported by Podsites this month. Is your podcast advertising working? Brands and agencies use Podsites to validate and scale their podcast advertising. Learn more at podsites.com. That's P-O-D-S-I-G-H-T-S dot C-O-M. Special thanks to our sponsors for making Sounds Profitable possible. Check them out by going to soundsprofitable.com and clicking on their logos in the articles. Brian, welcome to Sounds Profitable Ad Tech Applied. Thanks for having me here. Uh, it's uh, great great to be a reoccurring guest on the show. <laughs> on my show. On your show. Well, you, uh, you've been blowing up everywhere. It's so awesome to see the growth of Ariel Nissenblatt all over uh, podcasting Twitter, helping people, you know, on the creator side, on the enterprise side, and and you're traveling soon. You want to talk about that for a second? I am. I'm traveling a lot. Well, both of us are going to be at Podcast Movement. We'll talk about that in just a second. But then I am also going to Malaysia for Radio Days Asia. Shout out to James Cridland who pitched me as a speaker. I'm going to be speaking about social media for podcasters, and I just have to amend my deck a little bit so that it's not U.S. social media focused, but more global social media focused. So I'm going to be doing some learning in the next few weeks about social media platforms that are popular in Asia. So I'm pumped about that. That's incredibly exciting. I think uh, just earlier this year was the first time I got to speak outside the country, and I went to uh, Sweden, and I spoke in London, too, and um, both of those experiences were honestly really exciting because there are a lot of people with different opinions and different thoughts and different success and failures in podcasting outside the U.S., and sometimes it gets a little echo chambery. so I cannot wait to do a recap episode with you when you get back from Radio Days Asia. Yeah, I can't wait to hear what the pain points are and the successes for podcasters and audio people in different parts of the world, because you're right. I definitely hear a lot from podcasters who are US or UK based. And I think it's important for us to step outside of that semi-comfortable zone, semi-comfort zone. I completely agree. Today on the show, you are going to be talking with Tamara Zubati. I'm pumped for this conversation. We'll get to your conversation with her shortly. She is the co-founder and CEO of Barometer. But first, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Let's talk about podcast movement. Let's talk about the Sounds Profitable Sponsor Summit that is taking place on Tuesday, August 23rd. We already have almost 200 people signed up to attend. Yeah, actually, as of this recording, so we're recording on the 9th. I believe this will release possibly while we're already at the summit or after the summit. Um, so we're looking at 200 to 250 people. We just crossed 200, which is amazing. We're about to cross 100 total sponsors. It sounds profitable. Uh, this is our first summit. This is our biggest research report. The creators was our first way to like kick out into the space. But this, after these messages, report all about host read live reads versus host read scripted versus announcer read scripted is going to be our biggest report we've ever done. All of this is wrapping up the month before Sounds Profitable turns two. So I am just blown away by it. We have so many great speakers. We're speaking on programmatic. We're speaking on measurement. We're speaking on video. And then, of course, Tom doing the research at the end. And the thing that I'm really excited about is providing the time in between each of those panels so that everybody can go meet and mingle and talk and do business because that's really our goal. Sounds Profitable is built to educate every single person in the space, connect as many people as possible, and really make it profitable for all of you. So by the time you're listening to this, the event probably has already started or is over, but we plan to do this every quarter. At a minimum, we will be doing this at Podcast Movement Evolutions, and we would love for you to consider being there. And if you want to be there, you need to be a sponsor. And if you're not yet a sponsor, you can learn more about becoming a sponsor by emailing Brian. That's brian at soundsprofitable.com. Yep. Very ad, very ad uh, speech of me, which is good. It's fitting for what our conversation is going to be about in just a moment. But I have one more piece of housekeeping that I'd like to touch on. We now have two podcasts in the Sounds Profitable orbit. We've got the English feed and the Spanish feed. Yeah. So I decided to combine everything because I felt like we were splitting things too far. If you look at just English Outside of two feeds that we decided to completely retire, which were uh, the Up Next, which is our um, audio format upfront, which we're going to take another swing at in a different version in the future, but we just weren't revisiting the feed. It's over a year old, so I retired it. And 
the audio version of the Podscape. I don't think that landed, that last one. I think it was a neat attempt. I don't think it got the attention it wanted. It wasn't the assets and the value that I had hoped for. So we kind of moved away from those two. But then if you look at English, we had Ad Tech Applied. We had the narrated articles and we had the download. And we also have the new podcast that will be coming out soon. We started as a sponsor-only webinar. We'll be turning it into a podcast video and audio soon called Unplugged. All of those as separate locations, that's asking a lot. Like Sounds Profitable, I think, is doing pretty well. But saying, hey, by the way, sign up to this one newsletter and these four podcasts feels goofy and feels like a great way to lose a lot of the audience. So all the content really does overlap in a way that is attractive for one person to want to hear all of it. If you don't want to hear one of the things, you'll know that on Tuesdays are the narrated articles, Wednesday is Ad Tech Applied, this show, or Unplugged, uh, and then Thursday will be the download. So that'll give you the opportunity to figure out which days are for you and which days aren't, and try something new out. Because while I'm a big fan of the show, because me and you are on it, I think that the download just might be the best thing that Sounds Profitable has put out. And we also have it in Spanish. So the Spanish version will be the narrated articles and the download in Spanish. And eventually, we might have a cool opportunity to do ad tech applied in Spanish. So I thought it would be a good way to combine that. I will say that some podcast players and some directories have been giving us some trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So you might see 400, 500 entries for Sounds Profit. But just let us know. Let us know. Yeah, let us know. (laughs) We want to work on it. I definitely said, I think this will work and redirected a bunch of things and merged a bunch of things. And I think it works more than it doesn't work. Um, But yeah, I think it was a good idea to consolidate it. And I apologize for anybody who's listening experience. I interrupted. I agree with that move. Thank you for explaining the new formatting system. We'll create some sort of nice looking graphic that explains which episodes are dropping when so that folks can really, you know, put it into their calendars and know what to expect and when to expect it. Let's get to your conversation with Tamara from Barometer. First of all, what is Barometer, Brian? So Barometer uh, was something that confused me a lot because I thought a lot of people were saying Barometric, one of the first companies I was at Mm. in podcasting. But Barometer is a company focused on brand suitability and safety. And so they do this by taking transcripts, which they get through their partners or directly through themselves. And they identify speakers on both sides. They process it with some really interesting approaches to machine learning. And they focus on applying the GARM, which is the Global Alliance for Responsible Media's framework to apply safety ratings to people's podcasts or to content. And we're going to go into it in the interview, but they they take it so much further than that because it's the simple things like keyword targeting isn't enough. It's a great first step, but it's a great way to also defund the news when you say nothing that says COVID-19, nothing that says shots because that's violence or, you know, there's so many different things you can skip over. So this is really the nuance in language to make sure that we are associating and not restricting connections between advertisers and publishers. How did you and Tamara get in touch at first? We met through Oxford Road originally. So Oxford Road, another sponsor, has been very interested in working with them for a while. And they are very focused on visibility and transparency and brand safety and suitability. I think a lot of the agencies are really focused on that because it's an area where they feel they can add the most value. Ad results and Veritone also have their own solutions for these. And a lot of them are considering working with partners like Barometer and Sounder. So uh, Oxford Road reached out, asked if I wanted to talk more about it, and uh, you know we hit it off immediately. Tamara is one of the smartest people I've ever met in podcasting. I think that we are going to hear her name and her company's name for a long time because she genuinely gets it and cares and is excited about it. So if you've ever watched one of my deep dives or anything where I super nerd out about something that you like, give 10% care or interest to, she matches that energy on this type of tech. And yes, we need that. We need people who get incredibly passionate and excited about all of this stuff, because that's the people who are going to solve it the right way instead of just the financially right way. That is definitely true. And I got the sense that her passion for it came across in your interview, which we'll get to in a second. One of the recurring trends in Sounds Profitable articles over the past two years has been brand safety and suitability. 
And a lot of the standards set out for defining safety and suitability were visual first, right? Visual ads. So we're at an interesting point in time where these discussions are taking place specifically for podcasting. And that is really what this conversation hinges on. So Brian, with that, why don't you bring us into your conversation? I'm excited for all of you to listen to an amazing interview with myself and Tamara Zubati of Barometer. You know, the first thing I really wanted to ask you was with all of your experience, and and I want to go a little bit more into your education and experience there, what inspired you to dig into brand suitability and safety? Yeah, that's a really good question. So Barometer was originally born in 2018 as a news analysis tool. And we started by creating these custom uh, AI modules that measure for like sensationalism and editorial bias in over 30,000 print news sources and the audience was consumers. And the reason why we wanted to do this was because basically we had a background, myself and my co-founder Grant, we both studied cognitive science at UCSD. So we were really interested in how people think, uh, what are the limits of being a human and how can we partner with machines to help us overcome those limits? And so one of the fundamental aspects of being a human is that everything that we experience is through a lens of bias. That's how our brain makes sense of the world. And so all of our actions are pretty biased. And that's what limits us from being uh, consistent at scale. And so that's really the power of AI. How we see it is being able to help people make data-driven decisions by providing them with consistent data. Um, And so kind of parallel to that, I was born in the Ukraine. I grew up summering with my grandma in Russia. And watching Channel One state-sponsored news because that was the only thing that was on and kind of (laughs) reflecting on like America and the freedoms that we have here, including freedom of speech and freedom of the press. And that kind of came at the same time as the increase in exponential user-generated content. So this started out in like digital media, like social and things like that. But now also with other channels, like there were literally tens of thousands of news sources that we had to process because the news was, was coming out. There was all of these bot generated stories and things like that. So content moderation at scale became something that we were really interested in because we were seeing how poorly it was being done um, and how kind of inconsistently it was being applied, not just in terms of like political inconsistency, but even like the things that people chose to focus on. Social media companies primarily focused on things that affected America. Meanwhile, people were taking over elections and ruining the livelihoods of people in other countries where it wasn't being prosecuted because there was nobody watching. Um, and so we that's kind of what drove us to be interested in content moderation and trying to make an AI tool that could help people get a more uh, consistent view on content at scale. That's awesome. And, and when you started this, this was in college. Yeah. Yeah. We started this at a hackathon in uh, I was a junior and uh, my co-founder was a senior in college. Um, and it was a Web3 values inspired hackathon. And originally we were like, what if we could make a tool that could listen to all of the news and also get feedback from all the cameras in the CTV or whatever and like reroute ambulances if the Twitter said that 100 people died, but only two people died or like something like that. But then we were like, wait, do we really want to power this uh, like surveillance state and work with the government? Like, <laughs> nah. um, and so that's how we pivoted to kind of analyzing just the news and trying to see what signals we could get from there. When you say analyze the news, like that's that's an interesting thing that you're you're taking this data in and you're processing it. And what we're seeing a lot of is that a lot of these tools are based on text. So yeah. to confirm here, the first part is that you're taking audio and you're transcribing it and you're identifying who the speakers are, the different aspects of it. And then from there, you're uh, processing it, right? Like you're you're using some sort of measuring stick to determine if it hits specific guidelines. And you partnered with GARM for that. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's right. So full disclosure, we have actually, since we were working on the news, made custom models that are only trained on podcast content examples. So it is text from actual podcasts because the way in which that text is presented is different than in in the news. But yeah, we kind of came across the GARM definitions after attending a brand suitability summit about a year and a half ago. And at that summit, we were so excited by the fact that there was this framework that existed that defined um, different categories. So they have like 11, they had at the time 11, now there's 12 uh, categories of things that could be in the content that at different levels of uh, risk or in different, if it's present in a certain way, it could be really problematic and harmful for uh, both advertisers, but also like the public. 
Um, and so I'm pretty sure the whole initiative was born out of a response to the harmful content that existed online that wasn't being moderated and was actually being advertised and monetized. Um, like, I don't know, like terrorism videos and like things like that, that are really dark. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we were super excited, uh, by this group, but then we kind of came across the limitations in the definitions were nerdy. So we were like, okay, forensic deep dive into these definitions. Like let's piece them apart. Let's find all these papers that can help us understand like what does it mean for something to be glamorizing surely we're not the first people to try to define that uh go read all the stanford articles about like what to do to do like how to parse that and then we had to formalize our own definitions for audio in order to develop data sets um to train uh, ai models and our approach was basically each of the components was sufficiently different that it required custom modeling for each of the each of them um and then yeah, that that was kind of the the impetus. That's awesome. And Garm is the Global Alliance for Responsible Media. Exactly. Yeah, it's a uh, it's like a small working group that is a was established by the World Federation of Advertisers, um, and it is really operationalized and used in mature advertising channels like display and CTV. And there's tons of measurement vendors, or I mean, like a handful of centralized measurement vendors that apply pretty much the same definitions that are now agreed upon in those spaces. So that seemed really exciting to us that we didn't have to go invent the wheel. Um, we could use this uh, framework that proposed definitions that are already common to the industry and extend them into audio. Awesome. I, you know, the the definitions me and you got off of another call just before this actually and you brought up something that was really interesting these definitions are built for visual mediums or text or other things well i guess mostly visual right because the one you specifically brought up that was really interesting to me was nudity yeah and so how in a podcast transcribed into text and processed through this how do you represent nudity how do, how is that defined and, and does that fit? And so not all of the frameworks that they build or not all of the classifications are relevant to podcasting and could be tweaked towards it. And so I know that that's an initiative for you. Uh, and, uh, you know, another uh, brand safety company out there, Sounder, uh, both of you are taking podcasting very seriously, are very interested in expanding that focus so that there is an audio specific subset there. Yeah, absolutely. And it's our dream and goal that we're working towards actively. And hopefully we'll have some exciting updates about soon um, to present those definitions to the public so that it's just as easy to identify the definitions for audio as it is for display or CTV. Love it. And, you know, these, um, these tools, right? These ad tech tools, I always advocate that ad tech isn't like autopilot, right? Isn't set it and forget it and walk away. I mean, theoretically, you can. If you train things and you set it up and you know your rules and you say, anything that passes this specific filter, I am okay with, then that's fine. But I, I'm still not keen on the fact that people set it up correctly, fully themselves for approval yeah. or actually audit it often enough. Totally. It, these tools are built for someone to have an easier time of reviewing things, right? In buckets of severity. And Garmin is four levels of severity. Technically, they define three, but and that's kind of one of the one of the challenges is there's low risk, medium risk, and high risk. But that, mm -hmm. that's like there's no like safe category. Like there's no and then there's below the floor. Everything's risky. Yeah. So for us, we basically have a two step approach. So we look at whether there's a presence of a particular component. So whether there's any discussion of words or topics that are relevant to one component or another. And then if there's not then great. Okay, cool. No, no risk for that one. There might be another one. But if there is, then we launch into like the secondary phase of processing where we're looking at the tone and the context and how is the thing being talked about? And is it a chicken breast on a cooking show? Or is it um, an anatomy class, you know, that could be a lower risk subject? Or is it a shot in a basketball game versus a shot in a in another context, um, yeah. yeah, all of that is super tough. And that's really where the manual stuff comes in and the importance of validation becomes so important. So it's kind of two, two aspects to validation. The first part is making sure that your data set is actually calibrated correctly. And by that, I mean, if you're trying to make a classifier, you need to have at least as many examples of the thing that you're looking for as the thing that you're not looking for. And it's really tough when you're continuously aggregating data as we're processing content, we're getting more and more examples of each item. Well, every day you need to make sure that the model continues to be 50%, 50%. And you need to have a pool of 
data that you can pump in to balance the data set um, when it becomes off balance. So that's like from the engineering point of view, we have really amazing AI engineers. Uh, shout out to Divya. She's a mom of a young, young girl. Um, and she comes to us. She has like a PhD in um, astrophysics. I don't want to butcher this, but she worked wow. at NASA and the FDA. Her role at the FDA was predicting if like pacemakers were going to fail when they were inside people. So she's super literally life that's or serious. death. Yeah. And uh, the rigor that she brings to our machine learning approach is excellent. But then after you build the model, you got to test it thoroughly. And so we went through this process of like a closed beta where we didn't let anybody use it except for this small group of partners that we asked for candid feedback from. And oftentimes they would come to us with like existing pre-existing ideas about what should and shouldn't be in a set of episodes. And we would literally go through like the painstaking process of going line by line in a in a transcript and making sure that every single representation that we captured was true and a true example or not, and then training another data set. So we actually uh, had, we one of the learnings that we had through that process was like idiomatic usage of a word, like this sucks. Like that's not the same thing as another usage of the word suck that might yeah. be problematic. <laughs> um, and that took time to, to test and to to mm -hmm. understand and figure out. And eventually the goal of all of this testing wasn't to make like point-based solutions that allow like a publisher or somebody to put their finger on the scale, but rather to make like global rules that we could apply to the entire model and in perpetuity forever, be able to capture those things. Um, also, we work with a computational linguist and there's a lot of really interesting like nuance in the like linguistics of this. So it's like, there's certain I, I don't want to say like tricks, but there's certain patterns that are linguistically defined, like the use of the F word um, when somebody uses it like, like, uh, when they start their first sentence and the first word of every sentence is the F ing. Uh, that's actually like a slightly different part of speech than if you're using the F word yeah. in another way. So there's tons of li little details like that. Well, it's, so we got we went right into the weeds and it's a good thing here, but this is about taking the transcript or, or transcribing an ad or a show, running it through all of these processes, identifying whether there's the absence completely of any of any of the things that could trigger concern or then three steps on top of that from low risk all the way to high risk. Yeah. And you're talking about the complexities there of how people use language differently. I, I always default to my minor and minor version, right? Yeah. Like underage and person who works in the earth. But you know, your, your F word one right there is killer, right? Because that just by using it that way doesn't mean uh, the sexual intent. It doesn't mean that there's necessarily a charged, like vulgar mindset to it. Right. It depends on the crowd and the audience and how they interpret it. And this is where things get even more interesting because if you just do like your no risk one, the absence of that is got to be so powerful to me. Anybody using brand safety tools that can say this lacks any of the things I'm concerned of, let that pass through. There's no concern there on that end. I think that that's the closest you can get to like automated. The other ones are sorting into buckets for what you look at where there's going to be a lot of really hard conversations. I, I truly believe that nobody is like, Oh my God, I'm 45 minutes into the podcast. What is this? Joe Rogan? Oh no. Like this is some vile stuff. Like nobody wanders into a podcast. Yeah. They pick it. They know what it is. They know how this person talks, the, the totally. words that they're choosing to use or they bounce real quick. Totally. I think. Brand suitability and safety is, it, there's a lot of components of it. It's, um, does a mattress company want to stop selling mattress to racists? No, they would like everybody to buy their mattress. Do they want an audio clip of a racist saying a racist comment then into an ad about their mattresses? Definitely not. So it's about perception. Yeah. It's about association. It's not about the sale. It's about, can it be held accountable to them? And there's a lot of, varying comfort levels. And so tools like this are not going to solve all of your problems. It will if it lacks it there, but it's going to put it into buckets where you have to make hard decisions. Yeah. And what's really nice here is that this works for both the publisher and the advertiser. Yeah. I consistently advocate that publishers need to own their transcripts. You built your audio file. Why would you let somebody write a report on what it is and guess at the words and, and not be accurate, right? Totally. That's step one. 
Step two is it's process. Like you said, when they're processed, sometimes people come to you and say, well, this isn't what we expected. Um, because in advertising and in media, we have perceptions, right? Yep. We want to see the arrow go up and to the right. Anything that tells us anything but perfection, we tend to question the technology instead of believe that the content or our strategy might have not been the best approach. It's easier to blame tech yeah. than it is to take responsibility. And then step three is like the ad fit, right? Does the, does the ad fit with the content from the publisher side or does the content fit with the ad from the advertiser side? These are all tools that this enables. And, and, and what's cool here is that the speed of transcription, the speed of processing means that if either side says, yes, I want this. And the other one says no, whether the advertiser buying at scale or the publisher uh, selling at scale, you don't need the other one to opt in to have it. If you are selling your inventory in a space that doesn't ingest this type of data, you can still provide reports that say this shows you our ratings. Exactly. If you're buying advertising at scale from shows that are not providing their transcripts or not doing it, you can skip a few of the ad requests until you process it, but then you can start buying the ones that match for you. Exactly. And you brought up like so many awesome uh, points there. Like one of the points is people tend to believe that their views are more central than they really are. Um, and so that's kind of where we encounter like people thinking, uh, it's like my perfect baby content, like my darling uh, show and there can't be anything wrong with it. And one of the big learnings that we had from originally, like even from the news processing days is even those big, uh, news people that you trust, like AP and Reuters, there's great volatility. There's less volatility in their content than in other providers that are kind of less, um, like, I don't know, less, um, fact-based reporting. Um, yeah. But yeah, that, there's still volatility. And so being able to get that episode by episode analysis in order to inform a show level score. And like we go so far as to say like, there's a show level score that's the average of all the episodes we scored. What percentage of the content for each component exceeds that risk level, right? And the other part of that was the buckets. Like everybody cares about different buckets. We have some people that are like no politics. Other people are like no adult content. Well, fortunately, that's like a great asset of GARM, right? Is Sure, you didn't use the F word in a way that's adult, but it's still there. So if you care about yeah. obscenity, like that's still a feature. So the, that breakdown and that nuance we think is super interesting. But to your point, it's a really tough, tough thing for advertisers. And I'm not the ones that we work with so far. We've been able to analyze their shows that they're currently buying based on risk level and then the shows that they're considering for discovery. And it's remarkable how similar the risk profiles are of those two buckets. But not every brand has taken the time to sit and think about, like, um, do I care about this GARM component or do I care about, like, this component more than I care about mm, the performance? And where do they sit on each of those? And what we've learned is that typically they have very strong opinions about a couple and then less strong opinions about the rest. So it's very much what you're saying. It's about yeah. the, the buckets that they really care about. Yeah, exactly. If you, uh, Rush Limbaugh uh, performed incredibly well, from my understanding, on an advertising standpoint, and same people who would disregard other categories of the same type of um, uh, like host um, would would still spend on him because it was a known quantity that performed that was risky, but they understood the risk. Exactly. When you don't understand the risk and you don't want to dig into that, you don't want to listen to three hours of the person's content to make sure it fits with you. Yeah. Because every third one might not or might, you know, like it, it might be a waste of your time. No, totally. It's hard. Yeah. And I'd love to bring in the aspect of like beyond the transcript. Like that's something that we've been trying to do and doing um, in terms of like how we're thinking about news and how news is developing and how we're modeling debated sensitive social issues. But also like if a host is doing tax evasion, you're not going to learn about that in the episode. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like you need to have some outside data that informs you about that. And so that's actually what I'm really excited about too, is like brand suitability. I think about it as like, it's sure it's the next evolution for brand safety. It allows for more nuance and whatever everybody's risk profile is, but what's next? Like brand integrity. How do you think about that in the future? If we're thinking about hosts as not just content creators, but actually like influencers. And so it's not just about the content that they produce, but their lives apparently wow. because all of that ends up on the news and people and in twitter and then people experience that and that is also affecting the associations that they might have with an ad that's placed on that content so you're trying and this is just this is something you're actively working on but you're talking about the ability for in real time to be able to monitor other social feeds and stuff so if in the middle of a campaign if this is obviously dynamically inserted because it can be cut off or informed and you can cancel it um 
the host of a podcast that's performing well, super squeaky clean, no problems at all, all of a sudden becomes part of a scandal. You would be able to get notified of it, or it would just immediately take it off your ability to serve it, depending on the engine that that receives the data. That's you're talking about real world impact because these people are influencers. Yeah, exactly. That's our goal is like, yes, it would be lovely to have the brand suitability filters available for your vibe, but wouldn't it also be lovely to have a notification that tells you when your host that you love is in the news. And so in our dashboards right now, that's one of the things that we're working on building is like the notification side. So not just like when your show changes risk, because on average, the risk has gone up or down, but also like the host informing data. What about with one of the hosts is is in a scandal, like you're saying? Or the advertiser, right? If the ad, the company gets involved in a scandal for for how they produce their shoes or something like that, being able to just be like, ah, that doesn't that doesn't work for me, cancel it immediately and have that in your clause. That's a really valid point. I feel like creators are almost like left out of the conversation. Like it's like the publisher and the advertiser get to decide like what's going to happen. But I think it's really important, like for creators to understand and have all of that data available about who they are working with. And it's kind of a two-way street. It's like if you're a creator and you see that you want to work with a particular advertiser, you can understand what type of content that advertiser buys. And then you can align yourself to make sure that you're you're consistent with those requirements. Or you can look at an advertiser and be able to identify like, you know, that's really not somebody that I want to be associated with based on the people that they choose to be associated with. Yeah, this is I mean, this is killer. It's, I'm so happy that we're starting to see companies built in the audio space first for brand safety and suitability, because the truth is we have these companies out there that are incumbents in the digital advertising space on banners, on, you know, video and all that. And their response is, well, install the SDK in the app and we can take care of it. And it's oh well, it's keyword density. It's more than that. It's tone. It's the association. None of these things will ever be perfect, but they're all, you know, here to learn and here to grow. And that that's been my favorite part getting to collaborate with you is to to see how much you're willing to take in that feedback and grow what this product is. So it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. And I'm very, very excited to hear about your upcoming announcements. Thank you so much, Brian. I um, really appreciate the opportunity and excited to be a part of your community. Welcome back, listeners. Thank you for tuning into that conversation. Hope you got a lot out of it. You're about to get a lot more. Brian, how do you feel? I feel good. I feel like this is really exciting. And I, I feel like um, the people that grasp on and enjoy this conversation are the people that should be asking, you know, uh, the barometer team or the IAB or Garm or myself or you or Tom or literally anybody in the space that is active in these topics you know, how to get involved. Because if this got you excited, this is the time to dive in. Hell yeah. So I want to start off with a question that I think a lot of our listeners might be asking themselves, which is how does this conversation affect the average listener of this podcast? Let's start with advertisers. How does this affect the average listener who is an advertiser or who is representing an advertiser? Well, if you are buying ads on a show and you have the opportunity to listen to every show and multiple episodes from the show, read the description, search them on social media, all these different things, you're fine, right? You're hands on. You understand all of it. You really know what you're buying, right? But that's going to wear off after a while. A year of buying the same shows or only being able to expand by a few shows at a time, that's really tough. And it's going to prevent you having reach. You're going to default to some of the bigger shows out there just because you know you can trust them. This allows you to explore further. Reach is a really important part of podcasting, right? I think the people that listen to Sounds Profitable Well, there's only a couple hundred of you on this podcast currently, which is amazing for us, the things that I can get you excited about, the things that I can get you interested in purchasing or exploring or whatnot are going to be way different than the things that Conan O'Brien can get you interested in, even if it's the same thing. I can specifically talk about the same ad, but because we have a different relationship, it could be more effective. So by being able to find and trust that the content aligns with your goals as a buyer, I think that's really powerful for any buyer to be able to have at their disposal so that they can scale up and buy on many, many podcasts in a quick period of time. That's interesting because you and Conan O'Brien play the exact same role in my life. (laughs) (laughs) 
what giant nerds <laughs> who play video games sometimes and try and convince you to play them too. Yeah, and I have like a nice slack relationship with Conan O'Brien too. I Oh man. No, I wish. <laughs> Get him on a guest. Get him on the show. Uh, okay, next up, how <laughs> how does this conversation affect the average sounds profitable listener who is a publisher? Well, we think about brand safety as a way to just tell advertisers, hey, my content's safe, but we need to get in the mindset of saying, hey, your ad is safe for my content. Uh, we've seen tons of examples. I think we talked through a few of them in the interview too, but there are, there are ads out there that just don't match with your message, whether it's the content of the specific ad, whether it's the focus of that company overall, right? There's, I, I believe I heard, of a story about Fiji water being pulled off of a podcast because the practices behind Fiji water didn't align with what the host's goals were and how they carried themselves. And they weren't aware of it in that moment, right? They didn't, they had hmm. no knowledge until listeners started telling them like, Hey, do you agree with their actions? And they chose to remove that ad. That's really powerful. This yeah. could provide a preventative nature. I could say these are the things and topics, not just the IEB categories, but these are the social uh, social media implications of those brands that I want to avoid. These are their content in their ad, their categories, every last bit of detail. An ad's still content. So the match goes two ways. Everybody gets their own match key. And if it doesn't line up perfectly, it's not a good fit. And that's awesome. People are worried that that's going to reduce the amount of inventory or reduce the amount of revenue. That's okay. I advocate for a world where people don't have a small block list and a giant allow list or just let everything through. I am a fan of a small allow list that you keep growing on either side as you test and prove and make sure everybody hits your goals so that you can control how big it goes and you can control where you're lax or where you're strict. So having it on both sides really makes sure that the match is accurate. Yeah, that part of what you just mentioned is something that blew my mind as you and Tamara were talking. The conversation about not just indexing transcripts, but also indexing keywords and social media mentions in real time. So if a brand is advertising or if an advertiser is advertising on a podcast and then the person who hosts that podcast is embroiled in a scandal right then and there without even having to consult and send an angry email, pull our ads off now, those ads would just be pulled. That is the future. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's the hope, right? Or just getting into buckets to be aware, right? <clears throat> so that a human who is monitoring this can can make calls in real time, real quickly. Get a get, imagine getting a text message. You're managing all of the ads for New York Times, and you get a text message that just says, "Here's the ad. Do you want to listen to it? Here's how we rate it. We think you wanted to know about these ones. You listen to it real quick. You hit reject, and it's gone. Whether it's served or not is your choice. How lax you want to be on allowing it to serve and removing it, or having it pending until you approve it." These are the future. These tools really do improve the whole process. Let's talk quickly about definitions. Yeah. I have been thinking a lot about definitions lately because I think there's a fine line between gatekeeping and the need to define and delineate. Yes. So Tamara was talking about how there is a lot of discussion right now around definitions when it comes to ads in the advertising playbook for audio. Those are very important, but how do you, as Brian, as somebody who's advocating for the growth of the larger podcast industry, how do you make sure that we are defining, but also not gatekeeping? Can you give me an example of gatekeeping? I want to make sure that- Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely can. I've been thinking a lot about this when it comes to podcast taxonomy. So what is a producer? I like to a certain extent that a producer does many different things. And I don't want to be too rigid with that definition because I don't want to exclude some people from being a producer or an engineer or a showrunner or whatever it is. So the open nature of podcasting is so that we are still able to call ourselves a producer if we do X, Y, and Z. And I don't necessarily want somebody coming in and saying, oh, this person does X, Y, Z, and A. They are therefore no longer a producer. So do you see where I'm going with that? Yeah. And for the, you're talking about like for the example of how like nudity yes, exactly. works in visual and doesn't work in audio. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's okay to get, keep ads and categories think, of yes. ads versus people. <laughs> you know, I think I get what you're saying. I think we're in a weird phase because we're inheriting a lot of words from radio, from other advertising channels, from everywhere. Right. And 
uh, podcast taxonomy is fantastic, but Garm's a great example of an incumbent convention that we are trying to set up an audio subcommittee that will rewrite some aspects of it to make everything relevant to audio as well as visual, but the adoption just might not be there. So I think we do need rigidity in these things. And then what we really need is the right people to raise their hand and say, uh, this excludes X, Y, and Z and isn't a good thing. And then we adapt because we, in podcasting, I think we are afraid of labeling things because we're worried about excluding things, which is a very cool reason to kind of be afraid of that. There are some people who do want to label rigidly, and that's where I'm like, all right, let's pump the brakes a bit. Well, I think that we can label something rigidly to start and then take feedback on how to expand it and then soften the edges so it doesn't really matter. But you can know in the center what is and isn't. And then on the edges, sometimes it requires finesse and a little bit more of a conversation. If in your example that you gave, right, about a producer that you do more, well, maybe it's multiple titles or maybe if you 